Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we wanna say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Ryan S., Cindy W., and Sean M. New guest on the program today, Mr. Marcos Kramer is with us. Marcos is the founder and managing partner at Kramer & Kramer, a full service legal group with its main office in Panama City, Panama. The group offers legal work on business, immigration, tax, real estate, and many other matters. You can learn more about Kramer & Kramer and all of their services at their website, kramerlaw.com. Mr. Kramer, thanks for coming on the program. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you very much for the invite. We're very happy to join you today. Well, Marcos, how are things in Panama? Well, right now, after two years, uh, approximately, for, of the pandemic, Panama is starting, is starting, the business is starting to, to get up again. You know, our business, we, We've been dealing with several clients, and we haven't seen much uh, much problems on our side of the business because uh, at the, the same way as we've seen people from several countries having business affections or economic affections due to the pandemic, uh, we are seeing uh, those investors wanting to get away of their countries or looking for a plan B for investments, and Panama has come up as one of the options. So we've actually noticed uh, an increase of investors into the real estate industry in Panama, for example. I can say to the audience that I've used the services of Kramer & Kramer to my satisfaction. And before we get into a few topics here, Marcos, why don't you just give us a bit on your background and experience in the legal business? Okay, sure. Kramer & Kramer started in the year 2008. I've been a licensed attorney for approximately 16 years. And our group has been focusing on mostly on expat investors. Uh, from all over the world. So we have clients all the way from Canada to New Zealand, South Korea to South Africa and so on. Practicing mostly on matters such as uh, taxation, immigration, real estate law, and other other matters such as uh, asset protection, companies, businesses, and so on. And also just for the audience, uh, you are a citizen of a couple countries, correct? Well, that's correct. I hold dual citizenship of Panama and Brazil. So basically Panama, a country of territorial taxation, which is a topic we, we might cover later, and Brazil, a country of worldwide taxation for, for residents and, and citizens. So yes, I hold a dual citizenship and I've lived and studied and worked both in Brazil and Panama and Virginia, USA. Marcus, this great plague, as I like to call it, has been with us for like two years. And I know your business has been plenty busy. But in that time, has there been a specific client demand for certain services arising out of concerns for backup plans, et cetera? Can you speak just a little more detail as to what you're seeing out there? Okay, that's a good question, a good point. We're seeing a lot of clients, an increase of clients uh, from the crypto uh, you know, investment uh, niche, aside from other, other clients of clients, like retailers, uh, people who sell their businesses, uh, who have invested on the stock market, you know, we've, had, we've had a good raise on the last couple of years on the, on the market. Uh, and most of those folks, what they look for, it's either a plan B related to residency, uh, related to, for their family, for example, if there is some political or economical change in their own countries, they wanna have a plan B so they can protect their family. And that also relates to, to the economics. So for example, some people want uh, asset protection, some want to optimize uh, taxation when doable, when feasible, so yes, that's basically what we've seen from our client base. We have a notable investor demographic that makes up a lot of our audience on this program. You've got investors out there that have generated a lot of gains in the market over the last few years in places like, you know, just broad stock market, natural resources, segments of natural resources like uranium, copper, gold. You've got tech investors, you've got cryptocurrency investors. All of these groups, Marcos, have something in common. They have a need for strategy with respect to cost optimization, as you highlighted, wealth protection, overall global strategy. Speak specifically here. What things should investors be doing? And obviously, this is to a broad audience. It's going to be specific to individual clients. But what should they be doing when it comes to strategy? And where do you think 
you can help out? Asset protection, but mostly asset succession. Many folks, so once they uh, accumulate wealth, uh, we've seen many who are unprepared for asset succession. Okay, so there are several ways for them to do that. Uh, they have the options to do that uh, based in home, back home, but some want to do that with the second layer of protection and they go offshore for that. Okay, and the reasons are uh, the following one, diversification. Second, after protection itself, we just mentioned. And third, tax optimization. So that's basically what they're looking for. And we are we're in the capacity to assist clients on that matter because we, aside from Panama, we're based in Panama, we provide options for clients who need to uh, set up a living trusts or LLCs or offshore bank accounts in several countries within the Caribbean region. Say it Belize, BVI, Bahamas, St. Vincent, Nevis, uh, Panama as well. Uh, so all of those options come as popular options for those type of investors. Let's get into that just a little bit more about the business environment out there. And, you know, maybe you can speak a little bit to these jurisdictions, some of the pressures that are coming on these jurisdictions from even, you know, legacy nations, legacy organizations, um, which is probably a separate conversation, but feel free to touch on that. But also, let's include that. Let's talk about Panama for a moment as well. Obviously, Panama would be a business center. That would be a, a place that people would consider for setting up businesses. Talk about the cost structure in Panama in terms of the business environment, the banking environment, um, things like cost of living, which obviously to some is important, what the tax structure is like. You touched on that a little bit earlier. And just overall Panama and why having exposure to Panama can make sense. I like to say to clients when they ask what jurisdiction to choose, Clients used to, 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 to ask which one is better, and the answer to that uh, changes. It varies. But what they can say is that most jurisdictions have similarities. Okay, of course, they are different, but they have similarities when it comes to how the structure is set up. Differences come on A, language. For example, Panama is in Spanish. Other jurisdictions like the Caribbean ones will be in English. B, the legal system. Panama has a Nap Roman law or Napoleonic law, while the Caribbean countries, they mostly will have a common law. But a big difference is that Panama uh, has a stable US dollar on its economy, okay? And it has had so since, since Panama is a republic. Second, Panama is not an island. Panama is a continental country. So we've had many clients that, aside from the structure themselves, they have the curiosity to visit or even move to the country. And we've had clients moving from some Caribbean islands into Panama exactly for that reason. Panama is kind of like a bigger country, uh, although it's still small. Regarding banking, Panama has a very solid banking structure. Many clients will ask about uh, if Panama banks have uh, you know, insurance. Nonetheless, Panama does not have insurance. Some people get scared on that, on, on the banks, on the deposits. But there are many economic reports on that, on how Panama, without having a central bank and without having insurance on deposits, has had such a strong banking economy, okay? And yeah, so regarding businesses, many people come to invest in Panama or do business in Panama. I always like to point out that doing business in Panama, when it comes to taxation, is not different than most other countries. So the taxation within Panama can be high. Nonetheless, Panama offers the very much advantage that if you don't do business in Panama, but you have your asset structure within Panama, you get a very, a very low tax regime because of the territorial taxation that Panama has. And that's one of the reasons why Panama is so popular. Talk a little bit about the tax structure and more broadly, if you have a person that maybe you want to use Panama as a jurisdiction to have their business, but their business actually isn't operating in Panama, selling goods and services in Panama, but their business is operating in other jurisdictions. Talk about territorial tax structure. And then also, why don't we just talk just briefly about broad taxation in Panama from the sense of consumption and also real estate. Okay. First of all, we got to understand that in the world, there are approximately three type of taxation systems. We have worldwide taxation, which is what most countries do. We have non-taxation at all uh, on capital gains, which is like Dubai or Cayman Islands. And we have territorial taxation, uh, which very few countries have. The most popular ones will be Panama, Costa Rica, Uruguay, Hong Kong, 
But all of all of those countries, Panama is the only one that has a US dollar based economy. Aside from that, Panama is in the central position of the continent uh, with easy flights to North America, South America, Caribbean, and Europe. So that makes Panama apart from, from many countries. When it comes to the territorial taxation and the local taxation, the way to put this is basically Panama has a dual taxation system, local taxation for local persons and businesses, and no taxation when it comes to business activities or income from outside of Panama. For example, also by law, Panama interest on deposits are on Panamanian banks are not taxable, okay? So uh, Panama is in the position of offer a high interest on deposits uh, compared to other countries. So for example, you can make deposits in Panamanian banks with a yield that goes from 2% to 4% a year, and that interest generated is tax-free, okay, for Panama. When it comes to doing asset protection in Panama, the structures that we see the most, Andrew, is that folks who have, for example, seen businesses in this way, say that you sell on Amazon in the US, but you're buying from China. So you're buying from China, you're selling in the US, and your company is a Panamanian company. The proceeds that you generate from your sales in Amazon and comes to Panama, in Panama, it will not be taxed. This is a, a very popular structure or business niche for many, many of our clients who are non-American, okay? And that's kind of like how the taxation, the territorial taxation system works. People benefit from that in that manner. Now, if you are living in Panama, what taxes are you subject to? The local VAT tax, for example, it's a 7% currently. The VAT tax on hotels and hospitality business is a 10%. The local income taxation, it's 0% on the first $11,000 per year, net income. 15% on that threshold from $11,000 to $50,000 per year, and 25% above $50,000. Now, for companies, we have a flat taxation system of 25% on the net income. Recently, there has been a law based on the pandemic to assist local businesses. So they have lowered the taxation starting from 10 12% towards the 25%. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I appreciate the information there. And by the way, the, the 7% VAT for the audience, it's uh, selective. It's not on all goods and certain services as well, which is also very uh, convenient. You'll find that it doesn't apply to a lot of consumption items, um, especially things like food right. and certain services, like medical, et cetera. On the side here, you know, we do have investors in the natural resource sector, and I just thought of this. It just came up as you were talking. You had some recent news uh, in the mining sector in Panama where the government's uh, renegotiated a arrangement with First Quantum Minerals and the Cobra de Panama project, which is a large copper deposit in production. Talk about that for a moment. Maybe share some of your views on that, given our audience base as well. I think there would be some interest in hearing about that and hearing about the perspective of Panama and what happened with that matter. That's a very good uh, topic, uh, also a very confrontational topic right now in Panama. This company, they have generated a lot of jobs in the country, which is very good. The, the preliminary information we have is that the, they are producing a lot and exporting a lot of copper, generating much to the economy and for the company itself. There is always, when it comes to natural resources business, the local environmentalists, they are all protesting. And the local uh, political opposition they have been against it uh, and pressuring the government because of the very optimal contract that the previous government granted to the company. So at the moment, they are renegotiating the terms to try to favor a little bit more the government. As far as I, I know, the, the government was getting something around 1% or 2% uh, per year, and they consider that very very low amount, and they are trying to negotiate to raise it uh, in favor of the government, considering that the concession was given for multiple years, and it's going to affect the environment within the region of operation. And that is certainly a topic we can chat more about, but I'll leave it there. Other details involved there and why uh, certain things are happening here and an interesting one that we're still uh, looking over. Talk about real estate for a moment. Let's say I'm a investor coming into Panama looking to establish uh, some relationship in Panama. I'm coming from you know, Canada or Europe or United States, and I'm looking to buy real estate and maybe have a second home in Panama. Talk about some of the benefits to doing so. Talk about the attractiveness of the market from a value perspective and what someone could expect with regards to tax benefits and then also what they would be on the hook for as far as taxes. 
Okay, certainly. We've seen a very much increase on the real estate uh, interest from foreign investors in the, in the recent months, and so has been with the local realtors. So sales uh, have, have jumped, basically for a few reasons. Uh, the market has been a little bit stagnant, okay, on the last couple of years. Right now for the pandemic, but also the two years prior to that, it was a little bit in recession, mostly because Panama had a, approximately a 15 years run on the real estate sector, all the way from 2000, when Panama Canal was given back to Panama from the U.S. government, all the way to 2015. So the sector, the economy was fully based on the real estate, and we've seen developments on luxury condos, on shopping malls, on offices, on mid-class, on real estate as well, and neighborhoods. So the city, the, the country has grown very much uh, on those years. And right now, the last four or five years, uh, the market has been a little bit on, on, on recession on that. So it's been a, a buyer's market. So many people have been you know, diversing uh, investments into Panama real estate. We've seen even the clients buying multiple units in one single tower, for example. They tend to like to, to go into those uh, either uh, investments on the beach or on the city for those signature projects, for example, mostly for, for flip-flopping later or for having a second home or for doing rental investment on a U.S. dollar economy. Okay, so all of those variables come up to the determination of the investors at the end of the day, and we've seen that revamp right now. Let's say I come down and spend $250,000 on a new home construction in Panama. We'll warm up some of the common law audience. Uh, you know, they're coming out of the jurisdictions that I mentioned prior, coming in here, investing their money, buying property. Talk about the property structure. You actually own the land here when you do the process properly. Talk about the tax benefit of maybe building a new home of that value. Maybe just walk through just briefly a scenario. Okay, perfect. First of all, Panama has no restrictions to buy property by foreigners. In fact, many foreigners can buy property even remotely, you know, if they provide proper power of attorney and so on. In fact, you can also own property in your personal name. You can do co-ownership with your spouse, for example, or with your children. You can own uh, in a local Panamanian foundation, which works similar to a living trust, or uh, in a company. You can even buy property here with your company back home. So we assist many clients who choose for different reasons, for simplicity or for tax reasons back home. Uh, they might end up using a US LLC, for example, to acquire property in Panama. That's doable. We can assist on that and some attorneys can assist on that. Others don't know much about foreign companies. But we always recommend you to be assisted by an experienced attorney, mostly because and mostly if you're buying a secondhand property. When you're buying from a developer, if it is a well-known developer, you might be well off you know, going directly with the developer if you don't want to have an attorney assistance. But many people will try to save money buying on a second hand without an attorney, and that's where problems can happen. Okay? Uh, in Panama, you would mostly do uh, a 10% deposit. Uh, you usually sign two contracts. The first is like the, the reservation agreement, and then you'll do the closing within a few weeks or within a couple of months. That depends if the seller uh, is ready to sell, if he doesn't have any links on the property. You'll most likely buy title properties, okay? It's most of what's uh, available on offer. Although we also have right of possession, which bears a little bit more risk, but it's also more risk reward. And those are more available on, on areas in the countryside, on the beach regions. When you buy in Panama, it's the seller who pays the sales taxes and it's the seller who pays the realtor's fees. So the buyer only pays for the purchase and for his attorney's fees. Once you hold title, when you sell, you will have to pay sales taxes. The sales taxes, you pay a 2% transfer tax on the sale value and you have a 10% capital gain tax on the gain, uh, but the government, because many people wouldn't declare much gain here, uh, the government decided to establish a 3% flat tax on the sale amount in concept of capital gain taxation. So at the end of the day, you're really paying 2% transfer tax and 3% capital gain. So I like to say that's a 5% cost on taxation. And the usual realtor's commission, it's 5% as well. So that's usually the cost of the seller, 5 plus 5. 
okay? Rental, if you're doing rental of your property, there is local taxation, income tax on the rental. Regardless of, this is a common mistake or misunderstanding from folks uh, because they do an offshore company, they wanna benefit from territory taxation, but whenever you're talking about the rental tax, rental it's always linked to the location where the property is. So there is taxation on the income from rentals in Panama. Talk about a potential also, the way I understand it is still available, the tax holiday on new constructions of certain value. I understand there's still a tax holiday available for folks who do that, is that correct? That's partially correct, Andrew. Let me explain on this. Panama, whenever, I mean, we change governments, uh, you know, constantly every five years, and and they are updating the tax laws uh, relating to property at least two times every five years. We've had a tax holiday on new properties, which varies five years to 20 years, uh, depending on the year and on the on the value of the improvements. So it could be five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. Right now, if you buy partially new properties, so properties who were built five or 10 or 15 years ago, that property will have a tax holiday, which might be expiring two years, three, five, or 10, okay, from now. Nonetheless, the very recent properties, the ones that are built within the last two years or so, they are under a new tax regime. The new tax regime basically for properties established a different taxation, so you can no longer declare those improvements as before. What you're doing is that you can declare the property as a, as a patrimony, a property like, like your first property in Panama, your sole property in Panama, your family property in Panama, and then you can get uh, a tax holiday forever on the first uh, value of the property of $120,000, okay? And then you'll pay on the difference only. So that's how the new taxation for properties, for newly built properties is working. Very well, I appreciate that because that's also attractive. And then aside from other things like repossession auctions and other opportunities in Panama, talk about property tax for a moment. So when that tax is due on the property, talk about how that's assessed and what the rate of assessment is for that. Property taxes uh, are paid quarterly. So basically they are due on uh, April, 31st, August 31st, and December 31st. Okay, so it's divided in those in, in three payments, but the government gives you a 10% tax off if you do a full payment of the year by February 28th. Okay, so many clients just take advantage of that and you get a 10% off. The taxation on, on new properties, they vary. Okay, Th they can be 0.4%, 0.7%, or 0.9% on new properties if you declare them as a family patrimony. But if you don't, and you are under the old regime, under the old regime, the first $30,000, it's, uh, it's exempted of taxation. You'll pay on the difference. The tax can go anywhere from 1% all the way up to 2%. So what folks are doing is that they are transitioning from the old system to the new system. Also very important, when you buy a condo, many people, although you have the tax holiday, Many people get surprised by, uh, by some sort of taxation. And the thing is that the condos, whatever common areas they have on land, like where you have the little park, you know, the entrance, the swimming pools, and so on, that land gets some sort of taxation by the government, which is very high because those condos are usually located in good areas, expensive areas. Uh, and that land on condos, it's prorated between among all of the owners, the co-owners. So that might drop by bring up uh, $500 a year or so per unit. So uh, although you have the holiday, you do have that taxation, which doesn't have exemption. So we've, we've seen clients uh, surprised by that because they are not mentioned that by promoters of real estate market here or by the realtors. And that's important to mention. A good starter for the audience that's interested in Panamanian real estate. Uh substantial uh, good deals are to be found. And certainly as markets uh, in the U.S., Canada, et cetera, um, continue to become overvalued, I think that there's uh, going to be a natural tendency to look at other markets that are emerging markets, to developing and also offer a good amount of value with them as well and really good living conditions and considerations for the country. Marcos, how about the formal Panama residency program? 
why should this program be considered over a competing country program? And just give some basic details on the requirements investment uh, if you're going to seek out residency in Panama. Well, that's a very important topic, uh, Andrew. Panama is very popular for their residency programs, and there are several reasons why an expat could consider Panama versus other countries. So I like to classify or separate the clients here on the reasons why they do residency in Panama. So we have that investor who is a retiree, okay? And they are looking to diversify, they are looking for a plan B, or they're really looking to get the most bucks for their money by moving to uh, another country which might have lower cost. And Panama is one of the first of, of minds for that. Also, there are those investors who still have their business uh, back home, but they want to start diversifying, they want to start uh, getting a plan B for their family, or they want to do some tax optimization for their own business, their own wealth, okay? Uh, and they, they start looking for countries. So Panama has optimal residency programs because they are easy to obtain uh, with low documentation. They are easy to travel from, you know, like US or Canada or so, and uh, they might require low investment. So for example, retirees, as long as they have a monthly retirement or annuity income of $1,000 per month or $1,250 per month for a couple, they can easily apply and obtain permanent residency in Panama within six months by visiting Panama on two trips for seven, five days per trip. So they become a permanent resident of Panama and that's done. For folks who are not retirees, are just investors, the option they might have is by opening a business in Panama, they might obtain the residency. That residency though might take about three years for permanent residency. They used to take six months, but that program changed in August last year. Or they might also obtain the, the residency within three years and two or three trips to Panama. By investing in real estate, the minimum investment is $200,000 on any real estate. And it's allowed to have financing as long as it is by a local bank. We also have for wealthy investors, uh, the option to do a quick residency approved within 30 to 60 days. It's our red carpet visa. And all you need to do is uh, invest $300,000 in real estate. That is going to increase to $500,000 uh, on October 2022. We've had investors doing that option by doing $500,000 investment on the Panamanian stock market, like or, or on bonds and so on, by a, authorized by a Panamanian brokerage company. And some have even gone for the $750,000 fixed-term deposit in a Panamanian bank. Remember I mentioned earlier? Panamanian banks will do from 2 to 4% uh, annual yield. So those are some of the options we have. We also have for clients who are more into environmental uh, niche, we have the forestry visa, which requires investments in locally approved forestry programs for $100,000. And the residency will take three years. Or the expedite route, which takes one month to two months. Uh, which is $350,000 on forestry uh, programs in Panama. Very well. I appreciate the overview on that, Marcos. And I think there's a number of options for folks to consider. And yeah. uh, I would certainly not count this out, this program. And there are a number of routes. And so I would just encourage uh, anybody that's considering it to take a deeper dive, uh, have a conversation with a legal group such as Kramer & Kramer, for example, to talk about what potential options and routes are available to you and what can be done. Marcos, another question that came to mind as you were talking, Panama has been with Ecuador as far as, you know, U.S. dollar based, been a smart move when you look at places like Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and a number of Argentina that comes to mind. As things progress here and there's you know, more interest in what is money, what is currency, fiat currencies, printing presses, you see some of the things that are happening in legacy nations like the U.S., et cetera. As a country like Panama that uses, you know, the U.S. dollar, how do you see the government looks at that in terms of their risk mitigation, in terms of, you know, we've got natural resources, we've got banking and business economy, a attractive tax system, typically treating people better than potentially legacy nations. How do they look at that as far as managing currency risk? Do they consider things like 
cryptocurrency? Do they look at things like hard assets, things like gold, for example, which obviously uh, we could have a whole nother conversation about that. But as a Panamanian, what's your concern about making sure that the currency that's being used in Panama is well backed as other nations start to have challenges? Well, that's a very good question, Andrew. Listen, Panama is a country of opportunities and the country that that has a lot of potential. It really saddened me the fact that we, that our governors, they don't see uh, further on that matter. But yes, I, I will be very happy if our country took measures to mitigate the currency risk by investing more into into gold, by investing more into cryptocurrency, uh, and so on. But uh, to be honest with you, it seems not to be the interest. Panama is a rich country for several reasons. We are small territorially, but the territorial proportion is big when we consider that we are only a country of 4 million people, okay, uh, with a, a good concentration of foreigners. So the locals, they like to keep the status quo of how the country is exactly to keep taking up opportunities that the country grants, okay, versus thinking long term for the better stability of the country. So Panama has a very good backup, which is the Panama Canal. And that's really the main reason why Panama is what it is. It's all started by the Panama Canal and by the backup Panama had by the United States 110, 15 years ago, okay? So Panama is very much backed by the U.S., it's very much compromised with the U.S., and so with the U.S. dollar currency. Okay, that has been good until now, but I don't know how that brings us towards the future. I always see Panama having a, an option B back in their Panama Canal with, uh, with a new currency or with a, a new stronger country if that ever happens. But uh, right now, they don't take any efforts on that matter. They just keep very loyal to the United States and to the United States currency. That's how I see it for now. Good conversation points on that. And then also, you know, hopefully some of the folks you know, on the financial end in the government are bringing on the proper consultants to advise them on probably better strategy, future strategy, et cetera, because this is something that definitely needs to be watched. And I think something that will probably become an issue in our lifetimes. Appreciate your comments on that. Uh, just as we wrap up here, Marcos, um, how about initiatives at the company for 2022? You know, any new services being offered to clients, any particular focus for the firm going forward and new services that might be offered? We've been working on the last couple of years on increasing our option of services uh, and our availability as well. So, for instance, we just opened this week an, uh, a new office in Colon Island. So in Panamanian, it's Isla Colón and Boca del Toro. And we are all opening offices throughout this year in Switzerland. We are also uh, seeing the market in, uh, in Asia, probably in Vietnam. We have conversations to open offices in Vietnam and in Poland as well for the East European market. But basically, uh, one of the newest services we have and have is starting off uh, on the right foot, uh, offering uh, citizenship uh, by investment. We basically noticed that many of our existing client base, they, after doing asset protection or residency with Kramer & Kramer in Panama, they went off to do citizenship by investment in one of the Caribbean countries. So some of our clients, when they contracted our services, they already had uh, a passport by investment, or they did that later. Because we had the capacity and we're in the position to offer them uh, such service, which, by the way, we have offices for the last two years, we've, we, we have offices in the Eastern Caribbean island of St. Vincent and Grenadines. We just added that extra service about a year ago and uh, have been very well taken by our client base, where we are able to offer citizenship, that is a second passport by investment for the client and their main family circle as a plan B in countries or as a tax strategy planning in countries such as St. Lucia, Kitsan Nevis, Dominica, Vanuatu, Turkey, and Anguilla. So those are the countries we're working with. And yes, that's one of the services we're very happy to offer our clients. I can see, uh, you know, there's a number of reasons why people would do that. Some folks still wonder why they would consider a second or third citizenship. But uh, once you drill down and think about it for a while, there's lots of reasons that are not obvious initially. And insurance policy comes to mind. Some of the other things that you mentioned come to mind. Generational is uh, important. It becomes more and more of a consideration. And if you haven't gotten slapped in the face, what's happened over the last two years, it's good to be thinking this way, at least be considering it and understanding why. 
Well, to uh, wrap up, Marcos, um, I'm sure we've got some potential clients in the audience that might need services that you offer. Uh, what would you say to them, and why should they use you for international legal work? Okay, thank you, Andrew. We will be very happy to assist anyone interested in our services. We always advise clients to be assisted by, by an experienced attorney, by an experienced legal team. Uh, Kramer and Kramer is one of the options available for Panama. We basically will tell you clients uh, to, to choose our, our services because our team, we focus mostly, 95% of our client base are expats from English speaking countries. So we are experienced uh, on this specific niche of market. We have three offices operating in the country. So what, we're one of the very few firms who have offices in Panama City and in David Cherokee, which is close to the Highland region, uh, close to Costa Rica. And also 95% of, of our team is English speaking, is sufficient in English. Those are one of the reasons why our clients uh, choose us. Also, we are very uh, well versed with technology. We have one of the very few platforms uh, uh, through our website where you are able to, to navigate through all of our services, uh, see all of our upfront fees in a very transparent way, and you can even contract our services uh, online. Uh, and also, we accept all sorts of payment methods possible, such as fiat, uh, credit card, cryptocurrencies, PayPal, uh, and even deposits in several countries. Uh, we accept country uh, deposits in, in US dollar and bank accounts in the US, British pounds, Chinese yuan, South African rents. We have a whole financial structure. The same way we offer our clients uh, asset protection and financial diversification, uh, we do it ourselves as a legal team. So we are on, on the capacity of offer those services for our clients. The website is very well. I would encourage anybody that is listening that's interested, go to the website. There's a lot of good free information on there. There's a wealth of services. Depending on who you are, what you need, uh, I'm sure that the group would consider some type of short consultation call as well as uh, part of their offerings to initial folks who are interested. And Marcos, what's the best way for potential clients to get in touch with Kramer & Kramer? Well, basically, the, the, the easiest way is just visiting KramerLaw.com or just checking us on Google, Kramer & Kramer. You'll find us, uh, you know, information, our phone numbers or contact information or websites. You can even find reviews, authentic reviews of our company on Google or on lawyers.com. Marcos, thanks for helping out some of our clients. It's always good to chat and I appreciate your insights. Happy to be here with you and your listeners, Andrew. Thank you very much for the invite.